Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the transduction of painful stimuli. Okay, so sorry for the abrupt ending to the previous video. I made a terrible mess and have had to cut it all out. Right, okay, so basically this picture is now wrong because I drew this extra little Rex Ed Lamini here in yellow, and then I said that this was Rex Ed Lamini 9. That is wrong. That one is Rex Ed Lamini 8. Okay, or rather Rex Ed Lamina 8. Okay, so this one should be the yellow one. Okay, let's now show the correct Rex Ed Lamina 9. Rex Ed Lamina 9 actually consists of three little blobs here. Okay, so we'll do those in a colour that I can colour over yellow. We'll do it in vivid purple, which I think will oust to the yellow. That's done. Okay, so in vivid purple, here are the three portions of Rex of Lamine 9. Okay, and then finally, everything that is left is then considered Rex Ed Lamina 7. Okay, so all of this white bit now is Rex Ed Lamina 7. All of that is Rex Ed Lamina 7. Okay, right. So we now want to discuss where the central axon, axon uh, of the peripheral nociceptor is actually going to come into, basically. So we know that the central axon will divide into many different branches, and these will go up and down in the tract of this hour, and then they'll enter the dorsal horn of the spinal cord at different levels. Okay, so what we now want to ask is where do these axons terminate? Okay, well the answer to that question depends upon whether we are talking about C-fiber nociceptors or A-fiber nociceptors. Okay, so basically, if we are talking about C-fiber nociceptors, then what will happen is these axons will move into the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, okay, and they will go to Rex ed lamina, uh, laminae, rather, 1 and 2. Okay, so C fibers go to Rex ed lamina 1 and 2. Okay, and uh, in Rex ed lamina 1 and 2, they will synapse on their secondary neuron. So the secondary neuron will be in Rex ed lamina 1 and 2. Okay, now, there is a name for the combination of Rex ed lamina 1 and 2, and that is substantia gelatinosa. Okay, so the combination of the two is substantia gelatinosa. You will see some sources quoting substantia gelatinosa as Rex ed lamina 2 and 3. Now, the reason for the confusion is that you have one naming system for the grey matter of the spinal cord, which is the Rex ed lamina naming system, which we've just been through. Whereas the substantia gelatinosa is a visible landmark that you can see if you actually have a cross-section of the spinal cord. Okay, so if you take a cross-section of the spinal cord, you do not have a beautiful marking system for the Rex ed lamina already on there. Instead, basically, what you have to work with is things that you can see, and one of the noticeable landmarks that you can see near the back of the dorsal horn of the spinal cord is an area uh, that looks sort of gelatinous, called the substantia gelatinosa, okay? And some people will say that that's approximately within Rex ed lamina 1 and 2, some people will say that that's approximately in Rex ed lamina 2 and 3, you get the message, it's somewhere back there, and it, that area is where the C fibers actually terminate. Okay, right. So we'll say that it's approximately within Rex ed lamina uh, 1 and 2. Okay, right. Uh, so, meanwhile, the A fibers, they send their axons into the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. And basically, their fibers will go into Rex ed lamina 1 and 5 and they will then synapse on the secondary neuron within Rex ed lamina 1 and 5. Okay, so that's where the synapse onto the secondary neuron then occurs. Okay, so that's enough of the anatomy now. What I want to turn to is the mechanism of actually activating these nociceptors. So how do no noxious stimuli or painful stimuli actually activate the nociceptors to fire action potentials? Okay, right. So everything that I now tell you has been sourced from a certain review. 
Okay, so a lot of what I'm about to tell you is not standard enough yet to be put in textbooks. Okay, so instead I've gone to the secondary research literature, a review, to um, look for this information. So I want to now give you the reference so that you can uh, go and look at it and make sure that I have told you it right. Okay, so the review that I used was Dubin and Pata Putin. Okay, so let me just put this in. So the review is Dubin and Pata Putian. Okay, and Pata Putian. Uh, oh, sorry, that shouldn't be a capital. Never mind. Pata Putian. And uh, it's 2010. So I think if you type that into Google, you'll be able to get uh, this review. It's quite a long review, uh, but it's a good review. It's well written. Okay, so. Uh, Basically, we're going to talk about the noci sensors now. We're going to talk about the proteins which actually detect the noxious stimuli and then actually produce uh, some sort of distortion in the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane that is going to result in the production of an action potential. Okay, so I'm going to run you through now how uh, nociceptors are actually activated now. To start this all off, we need to have a good understanding of what it means to have an electrical potential difference across a cell membrane. Okay, so let's start with a discussion of what electrical potential difference means. So, basically, electrical potential is this concept from physics. Okay, it is a mathematical model to help us understand the world. Okay, so basically this is the model. To every single point in space, what you do is you ascribe a real number. Okay, now this real number can be positive, it can be zero, it can be negative. The point is that every point in space has a real number attached to it, and that real number is called the electrical potential. So in principle, you can have a little man okay uh, which has a machine for measuring electrical potential and he can go and stand anywhere in the universe and this machine will tell him what the electrical potential of that point in space is okay so basically the all the points within the cell are in electrical equilibrium with one another and therefore have the same electrical potential in addition all the points outside the cell they are all in electrical equilibrium with one another and all have the same electrical potential. However, you don't have the same electrical potential inside the cell as outside the cell necessarily. Okay, so basically this little man can go at, in the extracellular fluid and he can measure some electrical potential of the extracellular fluid which we will denote as capital E for electrical potential and then we'll subscript to E for extracellular okay he can then come into the intracellular fluid and measure electrical potential again okay and then we'll call this the electrical potential which will subscript I for intracellularly and these two numbers are not necessarily the same thing so there is an electrical potential difference across this cell membrane also called a voltage okay so strictly speaking when people talk about the voltage across the cell membrane or the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane what they should say is the electrical potential difference from extracellular to intracellular okay but often people omit the from extracellular to intracellular now what this strictly means is if you if you have this little man sitting in the extracellular fluid and he measures the electrical potential extracellularly on his machine and he then moves from extracellular to intracellular that number on his screen will change okay uh, the amount by which it changes is the electrical potential difference from extracellular to intracellular so how would we work this number out from these two numbers here well, basically, we would take the new electrical potential, the electrical potential intracellularly, which is the number on his screen after he has moved, and we would subtract the old electrical potential, which is the electrical potential that was initially on his screen before he moved, and that would give us how much it changed after he had moved. Okay, and this number is usually around negative 65 millivolts, which means that the electrical potential 
potential intracellularly is around 65 millivolts lower than the electrical potential extracellularly. So that's the usual electrical potential difference across cell membranes. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.